everyone. I'm Sam. And I'm Caitlin. And this is Team Get Over It. We're an all-female team participating in the greatest motoring adventure on the planet. The Mongol Rally. We'll be driving 10,000 miles across mountains, deserts, and unknown terrain. And along the way, we hope to spread our feminist and environmental ideals. Join us here as we share our stories, thoughts, and interviews as we get ready for the Mongol Rally 2021. Hello, hello, hello. Hey, what's up? Welcome back, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Get Over It podcast. Today, we're going to circle back to the spirit of adventure by regaling you with some of our adventure stories from our past. Mm, So the Mongol Rally is probably the most ambitious adventure either of us has attempted to date, but that doesn't mean that we're total amateurs. Far from it. Mm. Um, So... I think we think um, it would be useful to talk about where this itch started, where our sort of love for travel and danger originated um, for both of us. So let's begin. I'll go first. Um, Sure. I guess for me, I've always been really adventurous. I've always sort of, um, from a very young age, I knew I wanted to leave the country, I think, I always like to say, so both my parents left their home states and moved like to the other side of the country. So they were both from like um, Nebraska and Massachusetts, respectively. And their big move when they were younger was going to California. And like really, you know, like California was like sort of like getting away. It was like this big new place and then I like to think that like for me it was like I grew up in California and then I was always like okay well where do I go from here and it was like let's just go see the world so from a like a very young age I always knew I wanted to go abroad um and like wanted to even in college um but for numerous reasons um stayed within the country um but my first like real big experience with travel was studying abroad in London Mm -hmm. and that for me was like, I remember like having basically the time of my life for four months and not wanting to come back and being like, wow, living abroad is cool. Like being able to, um, I think, you know, especially like coming from the United States where it's like you travel, but you're still traveling within the United States for the most part, because it's such a huge country. Mm. So to go somewhere else into like where like, you know, sort of like weekend trips or short trips, you were able to go to different countries was just such a cool idea to me and um so like that was sort of like I guess what started it for me and then (laughs) it all it all followed suit um after I graduated I went abroad and never came back (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah that's true right going abroad and never going back I think you just kind of get and I'm at that stage now living abroad where uh a lot of my friends here are asking me, oh, when are you going to return to Canada? When are you going to return to Canada? And I'm just like, I'm not ready to go back yet. <laughs> you know, once you get a taste for it, there's just nothing else can compare. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's like, at least for me, and like, I think like we've talked about, I think it's the same for you. It's like once you see one place, right? Like once you live somewhere, you're like, oh, well, like you like learn. It's like the more places you visit, the more places you live, the more places you learn about. And so it's yeah. like every place I've visited, I'm like, oh, that's like three more places I want to go to now. Um, and so it's sort of like it seems like a never ending thing, right? Like you really could just spend the rest of your life exploring, I think. Like it, there's never going to be a point where you're like, yeah, I've seen everything. Yeah. And I mean, if you if if you feel like, you know, my personal philosophy is like, if you feel that you have seen everything at some point, then you're doing something wrong. <laughs> mm-hmm. There's no yeah. way. There's always something else. Um, so yeah, for me, um, where did it all start? I guess when I was young, I used to like to watch a lot of kind of documentaries about just like different places. Uh, so I was really big into the Discovery Channel and I loved watching programs about especially like Egypt. I was really into Egypt when I was a kid, as I'm sure many people were also into Egypt, but even, you know, European programs. And I think I was really into Asia for a while as well. And just seeing all these places on TV, uh, looking at the art, looking at the history of the culture, you know, I wanted to go there. I wanted to experience it for myself. And then also when I was younger, I read a lot of novels, especially fantasy novels. And my favorite kinds of novels are those where the main characters, the protagonist has to go on this like huge journey and like you know unite the lands against the evil you know very 
Lord of the Rings kind of stuff. Um, since I was 12, I've been reading this pretty long <laughs> uh, fantasy series called The Wheel of Time, which is totally mm. like that. It's like the main character is a guy from a small village and then, you know, he's the chosen one. So he has to unite the lands against evil. And it's just stories about, you know, him and his companions just adventuring like all over this mythical land. And, you know, I just I thought that was so cool. Um, and then I'm very much a homebody or I was very much a homebody. Like, you know, I like spending a lot of alone time in my house, reading books or playing video games. So I really didn't travel much when I was younger, except, uh, you know, the odd trip that we would do within Canada to go visit family. And those were most like since I had been doing that since I was young, those were all places that were already really familiar to me. So going to Toronto or going to like Pickering to see my uncle, you know, I never really traveled much outside of those kinds of comfort zones. So the first big adventure, I guess, that I took uh, when I was younger was going to university. So I just and like there was no real reason for this but except for uh, economical. So I chose to go to university uh, at Mun, which was in Newfoundland. So I was living in Prince Edward Island at the time and had been living there for most of my life. Uh, and I had never been to Newfoundland before. So it was kind of, you know, my first big trip by myself. You know, I was going to go there for a prolonged period of time. And Newfoundland too, like I actually had a really big culture shock when I moved there because it's it's totally different than any other part of Canada. Like mm. it's because it, it's isolated. It's an island. Uh, and you know, even it didn't, it was the last province to join Canada. I think it joined in like 1940. I'm going to get this wrong. 1947 or 1949. I always get confused, but after world war two, um, England decided to like sell Newfoundland or give Newfoundland to Canada. <laughs> I don't, I don't know the logistics of what happened there. Um, give so you a like, 50% discount. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You take it now. I'll include shipping. Yeah. And a lot of people in Newfoundland like still regard that as a bad move. I mean, there are like separatists in Newfoundland. It's really interesting. Um, and it's just, yeah, the people were totally different. So I had a, a pretty weird culture shock. And even when I lived in Newfoundland, uh, I pretty much just spent all my time on campus. Like I didn't really leave campus and explore St. John's, the city that the the university is in, for like two years. <laughs> <laughs> like my again I was just kind of in those little comfort zones so I was like on campus or I went to like uh Churchill Square to do my grocery shopping back when the save easy was still open or I'd go to like uh Subway and get a like subs <laughs> and then or I'd go up to like Kelsey Drive to do my shopping at Walmart and then I would come back and like that's all I ever did I didn't even go to, well I was underage so I couldn't go but I didn't even go downtown for the longest time and it's just you know I think at some point I was like, you know, I don't want to live this way anymore. It's like, I'm here. I might as well kind of enjoy myself more, like get to know my area. So then I started kind of just branching out. And I think the more that I got out there, the more comfortable I felt being out there. And then, you know, that was it. So I think like it took a while. <laughs> I've always had the spark, I think. But it just kind of took a while to become comfortable with traveling. And then, you know, now here I am. I've been living in Korea for four years. <laughs> mm. it's, it's interesting. Yeah. So was Korea your first international trip, I guess? Not my first international trip. So I think my first international the, my first international trip was a family trip so uh we went to because my father passed away when I was in high school so it was like grade 11 and then I guess when I was in grade 12 must have been so 16 years old 17 years old uh, my sister and myself and my mom went to Disneyland no 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 Disney World in Florida ah Okay. So that was our, that was my first international trip and it was like to the U S so, and it was with my family. So that was really interesting. My first solo, not solo or first, I guess, non-family international trip was at the end of my second year of university. I think my friend and I, because we were sick and tired of like the cold and the damp winter, uh, decided to go to the Dominican Republic as a kind of like present to ourselves. So not solo, solo. And then we were on a resort the whole time too, which I mean, I haven't been on a resort since. Uh, it's kind of not my travel style. So, but it was very much again, like a comfortable thing 
because there was like a yeah. Sh- yeah there was like nothing I, I didn't have to arrange anything myself like, you know there was like a shuttle and like you didn't have to go find food like the food was all provided for you like free booze that kind of thing I, I did talk a little bit to some of the people on the resort but for the most time I remember just uh that vacation was spent mostly sitting on the beach and reading books <laughs> like, <laughs> so it was like the same shit I do at home but just on a beach in the on Dominican. a beach yeah. <laughs> And I remember that was an all-inclusive trip, right? You yeah. told me that. Yeah. yeah. So, mm-hmm. I mean, sitting on the beach, drinks included, sounds like, you know, a good time to me. It was. It was very relaxing. And that's what we wanted. We wanted, like, you know, sun and relaxation. Um, mm-hmm. But, I, yeah, I haven't gone on that kind of a trip since. I think I think definitely my style has changed a lot. But how about you? What was your first sort of international trip? Was it when you went to college? No. Um, well, so I guess like London definitely was like, I guess the first what I consider the first big international trip. But technically, I went to Vancouver when I was like 10. Ooh, I want to say, yeah, um, went to went to the Canada, Canada, Canadia. I was like trying to think of a clever way to say Canadia. it. Um, yeah. The Canada Bay. Um, <laughs> oh, and, and um, it was for my dad's business trip so when I was younger Mm -hmm. um my dad worked for a landscape architect firm and he was a principal at the firm and so they would do I think it was like bi-yearly so two times a year they would do uh these like I guess I don't like conferences I don't really know how to call it where all the principals from the firms from like the branches all over the country would basically be flown somewhere to like do meetings and presentations on current projects and stuff like that and once a year they did like what they called like the big trip which was like either an international one or like sort of a destination like Hawaii or something like that um like you know like just like you know those like luxury trips I guess and they would invite the family Mm. um so like when I was younger we would do that um I never went on like the family didn't go on in the international ones for I think like monetary reasons Mm -hmm. um because it could be expensive. Um, but we did go to Canada. And I remember, okay, and I'm going to tell you this story. Um, I don't know if I've told anyone this story. Mm-hmm. I, for the longest time, okay, that trip was the one where I was like, I want to live in a city. That's when I knew. I was like, I want to live in a metropolitan area. Put me in a city. And I had decided at the age of 10 that I wanted to live in Vancouver. Okay. And the reason I wanted to live in Vancouver, there were two reasons. It was twofold. One, the hotel we stayed at was next to a spaghetti factory that t- had really good spaghetti. Whoa. Um, <laughs> and two, there was a store right at the base of the hotel that sold, I think it was sort of like an antique store, and they had this green sofa chair that mm-hmm. I wanted to buy. I wanted it so badly that I told myself as a 10-year-old that I was going to come back, move to Vancouver after I had finished high school buy this chair and live in Vancouver. And that was my plan. Um, And that was like the first, (laughs) um, I guess, like international trip for me. Um, That's interesting. I've never been back to Vancouver. I don't, (laughs) I doubt that chair is still there. (laughs) Um, But for years, and I mean, years, like to the point where I actually looked at universities in Vancouver, because I was like, I love Vancouver. Um, uh, Which is funny, because I feel like I've heard you talk about it. And your image of Vancouver is so different from what, like, my 10-year-old mind remembers. Well, yeah, because, well, I mean, okay, when I went to Vancouver, and I didn't really, I didn't know this, I mean, I should have looked it up, maybe, or whatever, I, that's not my style, but, um, so my friend, I was staying with my friend for a couple of days, is that the first time, it's not the first time I was in Vancouver, but the first time I was in Vancouver, it was just kind of like a layover thing, like, I, I didn't really do anything in the city, um, but the, the other time that I was going around the city was I was staying with my friend for a couple of days, and she lived in East Hastings, which, if you're listening to this podcast and you know anything about uh, Vancouver and East Hastings, then you're probably kind of making a wincing face or flinching in some way because <laughs> it's just East Hastings is sort of the like poor area I guess there's a lot of homeless people a lot of drug addicts and like the thing with Vancouver too is well in kind of Western Canada in general um, they do a lot of really hard drugs like we're talking meth we're talking fentanyl and there's just needles everywhere and I didn't know <laughs> I didn't know this so I was like hanging out with my friend and I thought like I thought her area was like nice enough um and we went to this place and then and we were watching this kind of like 
charity comedy show. And I thought it was really nice. Everybody was really kind, but they were sort of just letting anybody in and out. And then, uh, so from there, my purse got stolen and I was like, what? And then we were kind of like walking around the streets, trying to find the guy who like stole my purse while I'm on the phone with like the cops and I'm on the phone with the credit card company and whatever. And there were just like at nighttime, it was totally different. There were just like gangs and gangs of people like really kind of <laughs> dangerous looking people just like around and I remember at one point my friend was like uh make sure that you wear shoes like don't wear f- sandals or flip-flops when you go out in the streets and I was like what and then like yeah everywhere like just crunch crunch underfoot because you're just stepping on needles all the time and there's a lot of people that were like half dressed and like screaming at us and uh, that's that's my view of Vancouver <laughs> So not the green chair and spaghetti factory yeah, no. that I remember. <laughs> yeah. Needles and meth heads. Like, <laughs> okay, okay, good to know. Mm-hmm. Um, well, so I mean, obviously, like I think both you and I, like our travel has definitely evolved since we were younger, right? Like yeah. we're now a lot more. I don't want to say like willy nilly with our travel plans, but like mm-hmm. we are a little bit like lax and go with the flow. Oh, yeah. um, we've had some fun experiences, I think both separate and together. Um, so let's share some of those. Um, what like, I guess like first, like, I mean, we're talking together. So like, let's talk about our travels that we have done together because we've done a fair bit of traveling together. Yeah, we have. Um, yeah. <laughs> do you have like a favorite memory or like a story from any of our trips uh it's a good question I just I think well I think you know we we did a lot of traveling together within Korea but most of the traveling mm-hmm. we did together within Korea was always with a kind of a larger group so I suppose that wasn't there was only so much we could mess up with a big group yeah 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 and but I mean it was kind of the perfect group for us too because even because we usually we usually would do um our travels with this group called Seoul Hiking Group and I mean a lot of it was hiking based but like some of it too we would just go to like to see a festival or um which with splatterings of hiking but it was also very unstructured which was perfect for us so Mm -hmm. you know we would make suggestions like oh I want to go here I want to go here um we basically got them to make a make a trip just for us because I think you were leaving and we just suggested to the guy like hey Sam's leaving so can we can we go skiing and he was like sure and then he just like organized (laughs) a whole ski trip just for you it was pretty awesome such a good trip yeah so that was that was always really good. We were like, hey, Warren, we're just going to do this for a while. And they'd be like, OK. And then we would just go off and then do whatever. Um, but I think the first the first trip that we took together where I think we sort of discovered exactly how well we traveled together was when we went to Thailand. Mm, yeah, I would agree. Yeah. So for the, like the first half of the trip, which was lovely, like we, we spent our time with our our friend Henry and because he was living in Thailand, that was kind of the purpose of the trip to go see him, but also like visit Thailand. And it was your second time in Thailand, but my first. Mm-hmm. So I had like no idea what was going on. <laughs> um, and our friend, <laughs> our friend Henry, bless him. He he's really good at organizing trips like he had is such a good plan and I had so much fun when we hung out with him so we kind of all took a little vacation together and we went out to the countryside and we rented scooters and we and you know he he showed us so many sites um and it was absolutely lovely and then for the rest of the week our friend Henry went to work and then it was just the two of us kind of left to our own devices so I remember Henry asking us what are you gonna do for the rest of the week and we were just both like shrug I don't know (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we'll see and he was horrified like <laughs> you remember the look on his face yeah I yeah. remember it was like one of those moments where I'm pretty sure he looked at us and was like they're gonna get lost and never come back and like this is the last I see of them yeah <laughs> um but I mean we survived I think we did really well um yeah what did we end up doing we ended up going to the floating market yep um which I feel like wasn't it in, I can't really it's like been so long I'm old and my memory fails me yeah. <laughs> um but it was an adventure getting there right like we had trouble finding the bus I remember that oh yeah like we knew the bus station but we ended up like walking around trying to find the exact because like it's this 
I don't want to say it's massive, but it's kind of massive. Like when you have no clue where your bus is leaving from, like there's oh. so many like numbers and departure points. Yeah, right. Because like, we, we went to the same bus because like we went to the same bus station that Henry showed us, but Henry spoke. Yeah thai so at least he could like mm-hmm. talk to the people and ask because like they're like yeah because that building was huge and then there were all these little kiosks and then all this st- i mean some of the stuff was written in english but like even even the english letters like thai and like romanization doesn't really go hand in hand so i think we were having trouble just finding where to buy the ticket from <laughs> and we remember? kept getting sent back and forth yeah so, like I, I don't know if you remember like we went upstairs and they're like oh no no go downstairs so we went downstairs and someone said no like you have to go upstairs um and we went back upstairs and they're like no Oh, well, maybe like go across um, to the other side of this floor. And we went to the other side and they're like, no, you've got to go downstairs. And it went on like that for like, yep. I like, I think there was a point where I was like, I don't think we're getting on this bus. Like, I don't think we're going to find yeah. it in time. Mm-hmm. Um, but we did. Um, we and did. we had like a great time. Yeah. If we finally figured it out, because I think it was, geez, was it outside? Like it wasn't even in the building. I can't remember. It but, wasn't in the building. Yeah. It was yeah. one of the ones that was like chest outside. Oh, mm-hmm. it was ridiculous. So anyway, we got the tickets. We went there and I mean, and we had a good time and it, you know, our philosophy for that trip was just like cheap is better. Mm-hmm. And that served us so well. Yeah. Well, I remember when we first got there. So we went to... I'm I'm not going to remember the name of it now. I forget which floating market we went to. Me neither. But the bus dropped us off and they were like, this is the floating market. Mm-hmm. And I remember like I had read a little bit about it the night before. Um, So like I knew that there were multiple entrances to the market. I knew there was a place where you could walk and sort of overlook the market so that you didn't oh, yeah. have to be in a boat. Mm-hmm. Um, And then I also knew what the price of a boat should go for. Mm-hmm. And we got there. And there was like sort of like this little kiosk and the person behind it was like, you know, this is the only place you can get a boat to the market. And I think they were asking like 2000 baht or something like that. Oh, it was like ridiculous. And uh, yeah, originally they were, they were really high. And then we were like, no, I'm not paying that. Then they dropped it. And we were like, we're still not paying that. <laughs> and so then we're like, <laughs> I think eventually we were like, um, it's fine. We're just going to like walk around and explore. And they're like, no, 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 no. Like you can't get to the market if you walk. Um, and we're like, uh, we're going to figure it out. It's fine. <laughs> and so we yeah. just like walked away, um, having no clue where to go. And I think we wandered for a while. We definitely ended up on like some weird paths. At some point, we were walking alongside the river on a yeah. path that was like not a path. And I don't yeah. know if you remember seeing, um, I don't, it's, it's not the Komodo dragons. What, what are they in Thailand? Oh, the, God. Um, the little, the do you really, remember that? Uh, yeah. But yeah. The big, but we're, oh yeah. Monitors, monitors. Yeah, we ended up seeing one of those um, as, like, we're just, like, walking and wandering. Yeah. Um, and everyone and was then, staring like, at us, like, look at these white girls. What are they doing? And we're like, we don't know either. <laughs> I'm like, we have no clue where we are. Um, but we ended up, like, I remember we ended up, like, there was, like, a really nice lady who, like, pointed us in the direction. And she's like, walk that way. Um, and then we ended up finding... Um, another really nice lady whose family had a boat and they ended up taking us and it was a really good time yeah and it was not 2000 baht I think we paid like 300 or something yeah yeah it was way cheaper and like because I think the boats the really expensive boats they were full of people and then and they were also motorized which kind of I think yeah which we did not want I think like for me if you're gonna go to a floating market I don't know the motor is just like too noisy for me and that I mean that could just be like a personal thing I just I don't know. Well, then it's like, and it's not relaxing either. Yeah. Mm. So, and then we didn't buy anything. (laughs) No, we didn't. We just like, I don't know, looked at things. Yeah, because it was all like, it was all like touristy nonsense Mm -hmm. and and chopsticks, which I thought were hilarious because they don't use chopsticks in Thailand. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, I Uh, forgot about that. Yeah. And even, even the, because did we buy we must I think we did buy coconuts but we were we scoffed at the price because we were just like oh, it's cheaper down the road <laughs> <laughs> no we um yeah we definitely did buy coconuts I remember yeah. that but it I was think like you bought some food yeah I think we yeah we, we had some, something we had some food and then we had the coconuts and but we didn't buy any souvenirs we were just like oh it's all too expensive <laughs> It really was. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that was pretty good. Yeah. But I think that was a trip when like, you're right. Like that's when we really realized like we work well traveling together. And it sort of reminds me um, our interview on Tom's podcast, oh, the, yeah, the worst, worst traveler, traveler. Mm. when he was just like, what did he ask? He asked something like, um, 
do you guys think like you'll get on each other's like nerves or like um how do you think you'll travel together and it's like oh we already know like we know we travel well together which is like a unique trait in a friendship because not all friends travel well together yeah that's so true I think we're both the like same amount of like not giving a flip about anything (laughs) (laughs) so things happen and we're just like we're just gonna roll with it well there's like you know that that's something too that just comes from I think experience I guess like I mean it's part personality and then it's also part experience because I think like you know I've done enough traveling now in my in my time and you have too and I think we've both come to realize that it's you know whatever happens it's not the end of the world there's always a solution maybe you have to wait a little while or you get stuck somewhere but it's not like you know what's the worst case and the worst case is never as bad as you think it's going to be yeah really though Mm. I think that's pretty good. And then what else we do? So like the second trip that we took together was, uh, well, like, I mean, I came to visit you, but we were traveling around mm. Bali. Oh, that was such a good trip. Yeah, that was, was awesome. so many mishaps too, honestly. Yeah. Like that was a trip. Like I, I was thinking about it the other night when I was sort of just like glancing over our notes and like sort of like refreshing my memory on some of these travel stories. And I was like, that is a trip that like honestly goes down in the books of being like how – like the f did we actually survive that (laughs) like if you think about it you had no um headlight on your motorbike for a good part of the trip yeah um we almost got like stranded in the middle of like bali at one point with like (laughs) um yeah i don't know and like well and even like your whole like um ordeal like when you first landed i feel like let's just like get into this story because Mm -hmm. there's so much in it right (laughs) it's like it's a trove of gems, if you will. That was a pretty good trip. So <laughs> so I just, I flew into Denpasar and then usually, like, usually what I do for money is I just use my credit card and I just get it out at the ATM, um, mm-hmm. like in the country that I land in. It, it suits me because I, number one, don't like preparing for stuff. Number two, <laughs> uh, it's easy, it's convenient. So but in the exact same way. I never actually get cash before I go somewhere. Well, and I see because like on the on the foreign groups on Facebook and stuff, uh, people are always asking. It's like, hey, I'm coming into Korea and, you know, where can I get money exchanged? And I'm like, just fucking use, use your credit card. <laughs> like, just get it. And credit- actually, like travel hack, it's usually like a much better exchange rate if yes. you just use an ATM. Like, yes. You, like, You'll get like the ATM fee, but like exchange rate, you're going to get the best exchange rate through an ATM as opposed to like one of those, um, I forget what they're called, money converting stands. Yeah, the money exchange or whatever. Con- yeah, there currency we go. Exchange, <laughs> currency exchange. <clears throat> yeah, that's totally right. They Because they, they take a commission off of that. Like the ATM doesn't take mm-hmm. it. Like it takes its fee, but the, the fee is way less in commission. And I heard something else too. Something about in, like... If you use like a different ATM, like usually I think every 7-Eleven, which are everywhere, has global ATM. So it's going to work. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there's like a whole when bunch I of things. I lived in London. That's what I used. I used a 7-Eleven yeah. ATM. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've used it a couple of times in Korea too. And it's just like, it's so basic. Um, but anyway, so, but, but I was an idiot. Uh, Cause it was like a really, I can't sleep sitting up. I can't sleep on a plane or like on a boat or like mm. in a car or whatever. So I I spent like the whole time in my flight without any sleep and I I must have been up for like a really long time because I was exhausted and then and I very decent length flight too I think it was like oh gosh yeah it was like 10 hours because you have to do a layover yeah I had a layover in China oh oh Oh. yeah I was in China which is a whole other thing but I wasn't yeah because this is this is December 2019 so (laughs) <laughs> that was interesting. Um, oh, so, that would have been right before like was, everything went down. Yeah, I was on my return I didn't flight. Realize that my I I shared a flight with the first coronavirus case in no you Korea. Didn't. I did. Yeah, it was like a Chinese lady who was coming to Korea for work, and then like when she was in Korea, she got diagnosed with COVID, and I was on the same plane as her. How did you find out? It was in the news. Oh, it was like someone coming over on this flight from China. And I was like, I was on that flight. Maybe you're asymptomatic or like maybe you were asymptomatic and you're already immune. That's like maybe I, it's possible. Interesting. Yep. <laughs> anyway. Oh, my God. I didn't know that. OK, continuing. <laughs> um, oh, what was it? So, oh, yeah. So I was really tired um, and I don't really use my credit card that much 
anyway these days. So I totally just forgot what my pin was. So, you know, after putting my pin in wrong three times, it locked my card. And I was like, oh, no. Uh, plus, my phone was broken because I dropped it in the toilet when I was camping in October. And I oh, had it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I had it. So I couldn't, I couldn't like call anybody to fix it. And I was going to, so I, and I was going to get, so like my plan was get cash out, go to the like SIM card counter, get a SIM card. And then I could have like service when I was in Bali. Um, but because I couldn't get any cash out, I couldn't get a SIM card. So my phone was pretty much useless anyway. Plus it was broken. So, so and like the, there's not really Wi-Fi at the Denpasar airport either. So like it was really difficult um but mm-hmm. luckily i had a little bit of korean cash so i went to the i went to the currency exchange and i exchanged my korean cash for the indonesia what's the indonesian money rupiah rupiah so yes yeah, so i had like 300 rupiah or something which was just enough to kind of like get a cab and buy 300,000 yeah if you had 300 you would oh yeah 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 300, sorry <laughs> 300 rupiah is not a lot so 300 i want to say that's like 30 cents or something like that yeah Okay. And it was like some kind of three. <laughs> so I had just enough. Yeah. I had just enough to like get a cab, get some food and then check into my hostel. Cause the hostel I had to pay for in cash. And then like the next day you came and I was like in the hostel, I had Wi-Fi, and I was like, Sam, save me. <laughs> yeah. So I brought money. Um, yeah. I saved her. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what would have happened if like you were just like going to Bali on your own. I would have, I would have been, for for the lack of a better word, I would have been fucked. <laughs> like, <laughs> or I, I guess I could have tried to like find somebody else that I could PayPal money to to like take out for me. But they, like, I mean, who's gonna let me do that? Maybe the people at the hostel, but because it sounds really suspicious. But like, hey, hey, I'll PayPal you some money if you could uh, get out some cash for me. Like, <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it for me either. Yeah, I wouldn't either. Holy crap. Um, yeah, that was pretty bad. But yeah, I mean, it was all good because I was there. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was able to be your sugar mama for the trip. Oh, th- and, um, thank you f- and thank you for that. Mm, anytime. Um, but yeah, so I ended up driving up to meet Caitlin the next morning, which was always the plan. So I was living in Ubud at the time, which I want to say is like an hour away. Mm-hmm. Um, if you drive at a regular speed, um, like maybe like an hour and 15 if you're me um, who pulls over <laughs> all the time to look at their GPS. Um, yeah. But yeah. And then so we ended up getting Caitlin a bike and the plan was to drive down south um, to Uluwatu and we were going to camp down there. Um, and I'm trying to remember. I don't know if there was anything exciting about the drive down. Was there? I can't really. No, I don't think so. I think it was fine. We might have like gotten turned around a few times. We did end up circling. I don't know if you remember that. Oh, yes. Um, I should never lead. Like everyone should know I should never be the one with the GPS. But like, of course, like, you know, like I had been living there. It made logical sense. I would be the one like I like yeah. I had data. I had a phone like. And it was I only my second should... time on a bike. It was her second time on a bike. And so like, yes, it would make sense that I should lead. But um, let it be known. <laughs> um, when we're on the Mongol rally, do not give me the map. Because um, there was like one point where I literally just took us in like circles, I think like twice because I like missed her exit. I don't know. <laughs> um, but we ended up going down south to Uluwatu and camping on a beach, yep. um, which was not a designated camping site. Nope. Um, So it's like actually kind of unclear if we were allowed to do it. Um, I talked to a lot of people before I did it. Okay. Um, And it's fine, I think. (laughs) Well, I mean, nothing (laughs) bad happened. Nothing bad happened. It was actually beautiful. Um, Like we had the entire beach to ourselves except for the glampers. Do you remember the glampers? Yeah. yeah. Like a little little ways down the beach, they had these kinds of like domes, I guess, with these lights Mm -hmm. in it. And there was during the daytime, they would do um, like parasailing. Yeah. Yeah. And there were also some surfers too. Yeah. So they would just um, kind of like walk by our tent every once in a while. Spot. Yeah. Um, what was it? Was it you were like going to the bathroom early in the morning <laughs> when someone walked by? Oh yeah. Or changing or something? Oh, I can't well, remember. Yeah, because like okay, so I mean we just had these little tiny tents, like my tent's a one person tent, and then you have a bivy tent, right? So I mean if you want to mm-hmm. change your clothes or something, it's really hard to do that inside the tent. So we were just like we would just strip off like naked just <laughs> in 
the open. We thought no one was there. (laughs) To change our clothes. And then like, yeah, I remember like, I think we were, we were nude or I was nude or you were nude. Somebody was nude. And then like all of a sudden, like around kind of the curve of the beach, like somebody would come walking and we were like, oh crap, (laughs) to quickly like duck in or like put some clothes on. It was funny. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think, I think I was definitely like, yeah, doing my business. (laughs) Um, kind of behind a sparse bush and then like somebody walked by and I was just like if I stay perfectly still they won't see me (laughs) Um, so good yeah so that was the start of the trip Um, and it like you know everything seemed like it was going well and then I think I want to say was it the first night that we were together or the second night when we figured out your head or the front light on your bike didn't work at night Maybe the second night. I I, I want to say the second night because I think the first night we like were back at the beach by dark. Um, yeah. But the second night we ended up going to Uluwatu Temple to see a performance. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was you know it went late into the night. Um, and then I think we went and like got like pizza afterwards too. But I think it was like when we were leaving the temple. <laughs> and um so typically like for anyone that hasn't driven a bike usually when you turn on your bike and like it's sort of a certain amount of dimness like it's a certain time of night when it's already dark your bike will automatically turn on your light um some bikes i think have a switch that you can turn on but typically it's automatic um it recognizes it's time for the front light to go on um otherwise you can't see and you die um and we started like we turned on our bikes and i look over and I don't see anything from where Caitlin is. And it's like pitch black. And oh, I'm like, really but dark. I hear her bike going. <laughs> and I was like, is your light broken? Um, and like to like preface. So like, I want to say like where I was living in Bali, Ubud has like a fair amount of street lights. So like you could theoretically be okay getting back if you had like a broken headlight or something like that. Uluwatu not many street lights like they're it, they're few and far between like on these stretches of roads and we had to get back to like well one we had to get food two i think we had to stop by like a store to pick something up and three we had to like make it oh, back to the beach yeah i was like acclimatizing so i had like wicked headaches so we got some paracetamol at the store mm, okay that was it yeah yeah um <laughs> and caitlin had no light on her bike <laughs> 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 and so what we ended up doing and like god help us like i don't know how we like made it back um we ended up taking like your headlamp that like you yeah. use for hiking right yep. and like tying it around the front of her bike yeah, it was um fine. so it's this like tiny little thing that like maybe gave like a pinpoint of light in front of her um and then i drove in front basically so that my light could sort of like shine the way and she could just follow me yep. but it was these scariest thing because like when i say it was pitch black there was no lights besides like the headlights that your bikes provide Mm -hmm. like that's really all there was and i couldn't see caitlin behind me and she didn't have a working phone so she got lost she had no data she had no way to contact me um i don't know if you would have been able to find the the beach in the dark oh definitely Um, not and I had no clue if she was still following me or not because I couldn't see her. Like, like it was pitch black <laughs> behind me. I had no clue. So I just like drove like honestly like praying that like she didn't like crash or like pull over or need something or that another bike didn't come out and just like hit her because they thought nothing was there because oh. there was no light and no like <laughs> um, sign of human life where she was. Um, but I mean, we ended up making it. Um, I think we I, you food. were way... I- hearing this now I think you were way more concerned about it than I was I was like well this is an inconvenience but I'm fine (laughs) (laughs) I was like there was a period of time when I had no clue if you were behind me and like part of me was like as we were driving I was like what's the worst that could happen I was like oh actually like a lot pretty bad I was like "Uh, it's like pretty bad like I don't know what she like I was like I don't know what she would do if like we got separated (laughs) um Luckily, it was fine. Yeah. Um, and your light ended up working halfway through the trip. It started working. Yeah, again. I, just, I don't know what happened with that. My bike was my bike was weird. <laughs> it was mm-hmm. it, it worked well, kind of, sort of. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, and then what what ended up happening in the rest of the trip? So we spent two days in Uluwatu, yeah. and then we went back to Ubud for Christmas and Christmas Eve. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we went up north to. Was it Mundu? I don't remember. Because we were just, I just remember like we were, I don't remember the name of any like places exactly. Because you wanted to go camping. 
Yeah, I and did. There, <laughs> and there was like, and there was like that camping place on the lake, which was yeah. lovely. It was a really nice spot. Yeah, we went to, we went north to Moon Duke. Yeah, um, I feel like getting there was the like funniest experience of the entire trip. Like I'm just thinking about that day when you think about it. It's like the roads we took. Uh huh pushing your bike up a hill oh my gosh yeah my flat tire yeah well because okay yeah so that's like leading to like the the shenanigans with my bike so like you know the the light wouldn't work and then it it eventually like halfway through the trip started working I don't know what happened there um and then my bike was also because your bike definitely had more cc's than mine did I don't know how many Mm -hmm. cc's mine had but it was not yours had no cc's I don't know what type of bike you had that was like a, a child's motorbike yeah like, it, it didn't it didn't have any it kind had of power. no horsepower none so we're we're trying to go like we're trying to go up this hill because we were looking for this waterfall hike thing that we could do and then so it was like all in these like rice fields and in who knows where just like these random little footpaths not even roads um so we're trying to go up one and like again we're looking for a waterfall so it's like a, a pretty high elevation so we're going up all these hills and my bike just wouldn't go <laughs> So I had to get off the bike and like push it up these hills and the hills were pretty steep. Um, so I had to, and it was really tough to do. So like, and you were way in front of me too. Mm-hmm. So I was like, well, I hope she notices that I'm not following her anymore. Cause like, I couldn't yell to you over the, uh, like over the sound of the engines. And then also like, I, like I couldn't contact you on my phone cause my phone doesn't work. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like, oh man, that was pretty wild. Um, well, and I remember this exact moment because it was like, it was a scary hill. I will say that like having like, at, by, at that point I had been driving a motorbike for, I want to say like two years or mm-hmm. something like that. It was fairly comfortable on a bike. Mm-hmm. And I remember going up that hill and it was like one of those really rocky, super uneven. It wasn't a, like, it was a footpath, just like you said. Yeah. And there was a point where like, the slope like curved and we actually like went diagonally like our bikes were on a diagonal and I remember going and being like this is terrifying for me this is Caitlin's second time on a motorbike I am going to kill her Uh, (laughs) like I was like where have I taken us um and so I remember my bike had trouble getting up this one hill Mm -hmm. so like I was like I couldn't stop to like check to see if you were behind me I was like I just have to like done it I I had to keep going and so I finally got up I got to the top of the hill and I pull over and I wait for Caitlin and I'm sitting there and I'm waiting and I'm like oh god like I hope she comes up because like if she like crashes on this hill I'm gonna feel so bad um and I think I waited like five minutes and I started getting like a little bit concerned and I like parked my bike and I walked over to the top of the hill and I looked down I don't see you and I'm like (laughs) shit like where is she I was like I was honestly about to start walking down and then do you remember this there was um I see and so like when I say footpath there is room for one bike going one direction on this path I see coming like sort of towards us um these two boys I want to say it was like the oldest who was driving looked maybe 10 um and then he had I think his little brother um riding behind him and he starts going down the hill and I'm like oh shit he's gonna like hit like they're gonna like like they're gonna go head to head like it's like Caitlin and like Uh um him like I was like there's no room (laughs) and I see them going I was like well like at least they'll find out what happens to Caitlin um and I wait for a few seconds and then all of a sudden I see your bike come across like the like you know the peak of the hill it starts coming into view and it's you pushing it with these two little boys pushing it behind you (laughs) <laughs> i gotta say the balinese are so friendly and they're so helpful mm-hmm. and nice um because yeah so i mean yeah so like my bike just like wouldn't go anymore so like i said i just got off the bike and i started pushing it but like the thing those bikes are really heavy and like sam was yeah. saying it's like this the slope i guess on this hill on this footpath is really steep so and i just i don't have the kind of strength to push that thing up so like i'm i'm gently throttling the bike while I'm pushing it so like I'm fighting with the bike so it doesn't get away from me but I also like need to throttle it so that it'll go up and so like my arms are hurting a lot like straining with the effort of like simultaneously pushing the bike and also holding it back and then but like I you know I'm slowly making progress and I'm like well hopefully Sam is not like getting too far away from me (laughs) (laughs) because I won't be able to find her this is going to take me a while and yeah and then the kids came down 
down. And I just, I saw them passing and I kind of nodded to them and I just like kept pushing. I didn't really think anything of it. And then suddenly the bike got like way easier to push. And I was like, oh, what? And I looked behind me and like, they're pu- like, I didn't even ask. I didn't say anything. They just sort of started doing it of their own volition. And I'm like, thank you. <laughs> like <laughs> My heroes. And then we got the bike up and then it was, and it was fine. But like, yeah, those, I couldn't, even in the mountains, like on the less steep slope, like I lost so much speed just kind of going up because the bike just didn't have any power to it whatsoever. No power, but was a gas guzzler. It was. Yeah. You went through gas so quickly. Yeah. And it's true. Like we went to Moonduke, which is a very hilly part of Bali. Huh. Um, and your bike could not do hills. <laughs> not, not at all. I remember like going up some of the, like the highways, all the cars were passing us and stuff because they're going much faster than me. And I'm just kind of like creeping along like that. <laughs> because like, mm-hmm. and I was like full throttle, like I was gunning it and it like still couldn't go. So anyway, but we survived. And then I think the other really fun thing that happened, not my bike this time, your bike. <laughs> it was the same day. It was same after, like a few hours later, yeah. my bike had <laughs> issues. Um, <laughs> yeah. So like what ended up happening is like, I mean, we made it. We finally made it to the waterfall, um, which was beautiful. We ended up hiking down. Our guide was so nice. We ended Super up like, nice. do you remember like eating like with his family for a little bit? You tried yeah. durian for the first time. Yeah. yeah. Um. And so we said goodbye to them um, and we started driving. I think we had like a half hour drive, I want to say, to our campsite. Um, Mm. And um, we like headed on our way. Um, It was like getting around the time, like it was getting close to dusk, I want to say, by this point. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we start driving and I think like it must have been 10 minutes in. I could feel that my bike was off. I was like, something's wrong. And so I pulled over. Um, and you pulled up behind me and I turned around and I was like, is my back tire flat? And you look and you're like, yeah, that is flat. Um, and I was like, shit. Like, I was like, I don't know what to do. Um, and I'm like looking around and I'm like, um, I think we were just like standing there and I was like looking at my tire. Um, and then there were these, gr- it was like a group of teenage boys. Yeah. Um, that were sort of like just up a hill from us. And I think they saw us pull over and look at my bike and so they came down and one of them asked, like, like, are you OK? And at first we were speaking Indonesian and I was trying to explain in Indonesian that, you know, my tire was flat, but I didn't have the vocabulary. So I think mm-hmm. I like literally said, like, my bike is bad. Oh, <laughs> nice. Like that was like or like I don't even I think I literally said my bike is not good. I like didn't have the vocabulary. And then they like looked at the tire and they're like, oh, Yeah. Um, and so I asked, I was like, is there a mechanic around? Mm -hmm. And they like sort of consulted and they're like, um, did they, um, was that when they helped us or did we drive a little bit first and then they came and helped us? No, I think they just straight up just helped us. They were just like, there's no way these girls are going to be able to do that by themselves. (laughs) No, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so the thing was, it was, I want to say like 5 PM on, I don't even know what day it was. Mm -hmm. Um, when most mechanics close around 4 PM. Mm. And so they were just kind of like, oh, there's like maybe a mechanic. Um, yeah. So what ended up happening, they were so nice because I don't know what would have happened if they hadn't helped us. We would not have found a mechanic. No. Nah. Um, and we would have camped on the side of the road. Yeah. Well, we would have had to leave your bike, I guess. And I would have driven on my bike with the two of us, maybe. Yeah. I think I probably would have driven us on your bike yeah 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 yeah. Um, I, I've never driven with somebody on my bike before so that would have been a, that would have been a disaster <laughs> yeah and it would have been super interesting because we would have had two backpacks oh gosh um, yeah oh my god yeah um Ugh. but um so they ended up helping us and one of the boys took my bike because he was basically like it's too dangerous for you to be driving this like because yeah. it, it is it's like when um you have a flat tire it's like really hard to control the steering and like if you hit a rock in the wrong way like it can spin you out so mm-hmm. He took my bike and then his friend drove me and I like hopped on his friend's bike with him. And we went to like, I kid you not, like four mechanics. And like, I like I was so impressed with like how helpful they were because like, honestly, like I if I was in their position, like they like went above and beyond because like each mechanic we went to, they're like, no, we're closed. We're closed. Um, And at one point, um, one of the boys like 
asked, she was like, please, can you just open for these poor girls? Yeah. I heard him say that. Um, and I was like, and they're like, no, sorry. And uh, like at one point, like one of them went ahead and like drove, like we had to go like two towns over, I think, to find a mechanic yeah. that was finally open. Um, but it was really funny because we ended up having to drive back past the waterfall. Oh, yeah. And we saw the family, like our guide and his family, um, <laughs> sitting like in their, like at their store. Um, and we drive by, and it's like the one boy on the bike in front of, like on my bike leading the way. Um, Caitlin's following. I'm on like this other guy's bike. <laughs> and we just drove by and like slowly waved at them. And they hey. looked at us so confused, like, what happened? You just <laughs> left. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, we ended up like finding somewhere to like get a new tire, get my tire fixed, and then we're on our way. Um, but yeah, so nice. Like honestly, like I think we would have been up Shit's Creek if like those boys hadn't found us. And yeah, helped shout us. out to those guys. They, mm-hmm. dude, they really saved the day. They were the MVPs. They were of so that trip. nice. Yeah, and I remember, like, even, so, I mean, those guys were really nice. Uh, the guys who pushed my bike up the hill were also really nice. And then even, because remember, we were also kind of lost, and then that guy was, like, yelling us, yelling at us from out of his window. Do you remember? Is this, like, what part of the trip was this? I think I think we were looking, I think that was while we were looking for the waterfall, and we were still kind oh, of lost. Oh, we probably. Yeah, so we were, like, on a proper road. And then your GPS was telling us to go down, like, a footpath. And then you were like, this can't be right. And then so we were just kind of, like, on the side of the road, like, looking at the map. And then a guy was just like, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> and we just asked him for directions. And he was like, oh, yeah, you can go that way. And he was really friendly. <laughs> mm-hmm. just, yeah. Just this random man yelling at us from his window. It was really cool. Yeah. I honestly think the path I took us on was like unnecessarily difficult because I don't know if you remember mm-hmm. the GPS told me to turn down a different path before that, but there were cops oh. sort of waiting at that intersection. And right. so I was like, I I mean, I didn't want to sort of have to pay a fine, really. Yeah. Um or like I was like, I don't wanna <laughs> I don't wanna deal with it. Um yeah. we know my re- like we know what happens when Sam, you know, encounters authority figures, she just starts crying. So <laughs> Um, I was like, I was like, no. So we kept going and then it rerouted and t- was like, oh yeah, turn like on the next one. I was like, oh fine. But that was the small footpath that I was like, oh no. So I think it was probably much easier because if you think about it, the waterfall and the path leading out was, of the waterfall was, was like a, it was a fine road. I think I just took us on like a really, uh, you know, out of the way, small footpath. <laughs> And that's put us okay. Necessarily in danger. I mean, it was beautiful, though. It was like, really that nice. Path really was. Yeah, we were kind of in like a lot of lush sort of jungle forest with the trees, mm-hmm. and there was a lot of like small little houses. And we were watching for a while. I think you and I pulled over, and we were just like watching um, this farmer just in its in his rice field, and it was just so picturesque and so gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that was a really good time. And then I feel like the rest of the trip went smooth, right? Like, yeah, we camped um, by the late by the lake which was beautiful we yeah. made it back to ubud in one piece but it was it, it was, was raining. raining yeah it was rainy season oh. so when we when we like we got to the campsite we were the only people there and it like it was just kind of really it was not really a campsite it was just in somebody's backyard <laughs> and, yeah it really was and so so we're like knock on or did we knock on the door i think we just started setting up and then a guy came out like what's what's going on girls well, there was a number um there was a number that was like if you want to camp call this number oh ah, right Right, right, right. And then I called and was like, we want to camp. <laughs> and they were like, what? What? <laughs> like, are you sure? <laughs> Do you know what month it is? Like, <laughs> it's rainy season. And we're like, yeah, we want to camp. Yeah. But then when we drove back, and it's a long drive from Moon Duke, especially in the rain. Yeah. And it was like coming down at one point, like at some points. And I remember at one point we had gotten back into Ubud, but we were in... um. Panestanan, which is sort of like the opposite side of Ubud from where I lived. And the traffic during like, and we got back, I want to say it was like 3 p.m. or something like that, which is like, no, it was later. It was rush hour. I can't remember. But we got, we. I don't know if you remember, we were just sitting there in gridlock traffic. Mm-hmm. We were in Ubud. 
but it took us oh, like yeah. another 30 minutes to get to my house and it was just raining and I was so cold and so tired and I was like I just want to be home yeah. we survived though we did survive yeah I forgot about like so, like I don't really remember much about the rainy parts but it, it was really rainy and I remember I went down to, like from your house down the street there was that kind of like general store and I remember like mm-hmm. buying my own kind of rain poncho because it was just like I was sick of being wet I think I was like pretty soaked like driving on the bikes because until that time I didn't have a poncho and then I finally my headset one. from that trip like got fried because of the rain oh, because yeah. like I had my like headphones um so that I could hear the navigation without mm-hmm. having to look because safety friends safety safety, safety. um <laughs> <laughs> us, because us was lecturing like, about more... safety okay <laughs> <laughs> take what you will from our from our advice yeah. um but yeah like those headphones were they were destroyed after they were never the same they always made like a little crackling sound like oh yeah um but yeah and then the rest of the trip was fine i yeah. you impressed me when you made it all the way back to <laughs> Because you were in Kuta. You weren't even in Denpasar. Your hostel is in Kuta, which yes. is a little bit further. Um, and remember, if you don't remember from the start of the story, Caitlin's phone did not work. Yes. Um, really at all. <laughs> um, and she made it back, really, without using, I think, much navigation. Yes. And so had a good time. I think, yeah, I, I did, well, I did get a little bit lost and I stopped for breakfast at one point. So I think I, I think the whole trip was like, what, an hour and a half or something or like an hour mm-hmm. 40 or I can't remember. Um, but yeah, what did I do? So I left and well, for my phone. So I like I didn't have a SIM card or anything. I could use my phone for about like 40 minutes on a full battery because like the battery was the big problem on that thing. Um, and then so what I did is just before I left your house, I downloaded the offline maps that I needed. Uh, and I kind of was like, okay, well, I know this road, like the roads, like leading out of Denpasar. I was like, okay, like just making a mental sort of, I have to go this way, this way. And if I stay like pointing South and generally I'll find it. And like, mm-hmm. you know, reading the signs and stuff along the way. Um, and like every once in a while, like I would pull over and I had to like, so <laughs> I couldn't keep my phone on. So basically I was just driving in the general direction of what I thought I was supposed to go, like just look at the map and be like, okay, I have to go this way, this way. Okay. Okay. And then, um, so every once in a while, while I was driving, I would just pull over to check and make sure that I was still like going on the right road, but I would have to turn my phone off and like on again, like, every time I wanted to check the map, just so I wasn't like, I wasn't running out of battery too bad. And then, yeah, yeah. It, but it really wasn't that bad. But while I was driving, so again, this is the second time on a bike. And here I am with a phone that doesn't really work driving on like the streets of Bali. And like the way that they, the way that they drive in Southeast Asia uh, is totally different than anything else. Plus it's like, is it the wrong side of the road? The left side. Yeah, it's left side. Or the correct side. The correct side. <laughs> I still, okay. I still have trouble being in a car on the right side of the road after driving on the left side uh, for so long. Yeah, I bet. Um, like it really like weirds me out when we go down what I consider to be the wrong side of the road now. Oh. I've completely I've converted. You've converted. I mean, it was it's fine, but it's just it's a little bit trippy. Um It is. Yeah, it's definitely trippy. So, and then like, you know, I was taking I wasn't taking the small roads either. Like I was on highways, which is probably why I took like, and I was going pretty fast. I was doing like 70 or 80 if my bike like could get up that fast. Um, <laughs> and so I'm just cruising along. And then suddenly this guy, like a local uh, scoots up next to me and he starts yelling at me, but I can't really hear him. Like, cause I have my helmet on over my ears and, um, and like, you know, the engines of the bikes are going and there's a bit of traffic and stuff. But I think he's just like, he's kind of giving me the thumbs up. Like he was like, good job. Because I guess, I guess many women, like there's tons of women that drive in Bali, but I guess usually they stick to the local roads, not on the highway. Cause like, if I was looking around on the highway, it was just a bunch of dudes driving. There was no chicks like on their bikes. Hmm. So I think, I think what he was saying is like, Oh, usually girls like, you know, don't do this and you're doing a really good job. And I was like, thanks. But you know, it gave me a lot of courage. Um, but I was having a lot of fun I don't know too. I noticed that about the highways. I always thought it was like I feel like I always saw. Well, because okay, and so I guess like whenever I had to drive to Denpasar, and I didn't often. I actually always like drove behind sort of like the female scooterists because I found um, them to drive slower. Yeah, they or do. sort of more, I guess, in like safer um, than some of like the males on like the bigger highways. I hated driving the highways. Um, 
But I never noticed like any like I guess discrepancy. I wonder. I mean, it's something like I might not have been looking for it. I don't know. Yeah, because he was. This was one of the big highways. I think it was like four lanes or something, four or five lanes. And uh, yeah, it was just guys. It was just guys on the highways, and that's it. And I was the only girl. And also, I'm I'm a foreigner, so he probably was like really like whoa. <laughs> Mm. that's wild that could have been it um mm. yeah maybe yeah but i remember um because we got dinner with my friend acha the night before mm-hmm. and i remember like she asked like if i was gonna sort of drive you back to den Pasar, but i had to teach the next day mm-hmm. um <laughs> and so like the next day acha texted me to like see if you had made it like and if you were like okay um <laughs> because oh, like that's so sweet it's like not like the easiest drive and you did it so casually and so well. Um, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, she made it back. And like, I think I like you were like an hour and a half, like an hour and a half. And Andre was like, really? <laughs> and I was like, I know. She's like, oh, she's a good driver. And I was like, I know. No, there was no problem. And so, yeah, I, I hooked, I, I went back to the hostel and then I just kind of spent the day in Kuta and I went to the beach. And, um, but like, yeah, I didn't like Kuta as much as the rest of Bali because there's a lot of like snake oil salesmen and, and whatever. It's very touristy. So like a lot of people are like constantly bothering you to like, Kuta. yeah. And there's a lot of like, they have good food, I think, but. It always stressed me out to be there, honestly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just kind of a lot of like shopping and stuff. You hear it called Little Australia a lot because there are so many Australians there and they just go and they drink. And that's sort of what Kuta is known for is just like drinking and clubbing. And yeah. it was just not my scene when I was there. Um, I remember I went to Kuta once. Um, I really, I tried to avoid Kuta at all costs. I didn't like it. Yeah. Um and I went there once to surf and to meet up with someone to surf, but I ended up like going to the wrong beach and like didn't make it. And so like ended up like turning around. And I remember I came back and my roommate was like, oh, like you're back from Kuta already. How was surf? And I was like, I didn't make it to the beach. I don't like it. <laughs> um, I don't want to go back. Um, and he was like, good call. <laughs> um, he's like, don't, don't like Kuta, I think is like. It's um, a good, like, sort of beginner surf spot, but I was never a fan. It just didn't vibe with me. <laughs> I know some people, I have friends that love it, but for me, it was just not not my cup of tea. Yeah, from what I saw, it's like, it's really, it's because what's there? There was shopping. That's all it was. It was just shops and bars. Shops, bars. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, me neither. I, I much preferred, like, Ubud was really nice. The Going up north, because, like, up north, there was hardly any tourists at all. Uh, from what well, I saw. Nunduk is beautiful. Yeah, like, just so like the good. scenery. And the scenery was really nice. Yeah. And just like, the, it was so much more relaxed, I think. And, like, I felt so much mm-hmm. more happier up there. So, yes, if I'm going to go back to Bali, that's where I'm going to head, I think. But yeah, for sure. Anyway, so I think that pretty much sums up, like, our together travel stories. Um, besides like the couple of ones in Korea, but eh. <laughs> I mean, that's like, I think the majority, like listening to those stories, I think you get a pretty good sense of how we travel and how we cope <laughs> um, when we travel. We'll be sure to come back. We have honestly like pages and pages of travel stories that we'll share with you. So um, stay tuned. I don't know if we'll do it monthly or how often, but we'll definitely try to sort of keep these like fun adventure filled episodes in the mix for you guys um Hmm. thanks for tuning in thank you for joining us again yeah and catch us next time next time we have a really fun episode um we we're bringing in two family members so that they can sort of spill the beans about caitlin and sam like the behind the scenes so come back in two weeks for that episode it'll be a lot of fun bye 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 That's it for today, folks. Thanks so much for tuning in. And as always, please support this work by subscribing and donating to our cause at www.teamgetoveryit.com. Donors get access to specific content like stickers, t-shirts, and postcards from our journey. You can donate for as little as $5 and the benefits build from there. Go to our website for more information. Or find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Team Get Over It. Thanks for listening. And catch us next time on Get Over It.